So um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Obviously, pretty miserable weather um, to be coming. I'm Doug Clark. I'm from the College of Education. And today, obviously, some li aspects of life have changed immensely over the last 40 years. Um, medicine, for example, has changed extensively, even in the last 10 years. Um, education has changed very little by comparison. I mean, we don't have to talk 40 years, we can talk 4,000. Um, this is ancient Samaria, 2000 BC. Desks are lined up facing the front. There are tablets by the wall. We're ready for action. Um, ancient China, again, people in rows facing forward, listening to someone um, explain things. Same thing, Egypt. Here's San Francisco about a century ago. And here we have a classroom that really could be 40 years ago or today. I mean, I sat in those desks, and those desks are still there. And they're still organized the same way. So um, education is an area that hasn't changed a whole lot. And in fact, our current educational model is heavily influenced by the industrial era. And this idea, so we took the idea of people sit in front and explain things or say things, and people uh, out in the audience sit and listen and remember things. Uh, and then with the industrial era, what we decide is not only should we be doing that, but we sh everyone should be doing it at the same pace, at the same time, about the same thing. In the one-room schoolhouse and all those other ones, there was some understanding that people would be at different places and we would be differentiating instructions. But with the industrial era, you know, as Henry Ford said, you can have any color you want just so it's black. Um, same thing with education. We want people done at the same time. You're gonna, it's going to take you two weeks to learn Newtonian dynamics, and we'll give you a test, and then we're moving on. But you have two weeks. And so in some ways, it's even less adaptive than it was in those pictures of ancient Egypt. And obviously, the world is changing. We're no longer in the industrial era. We're in the information age. And education needs to change. And because technology has radically altered how we need to think, self-identify, and know. And this is a report by the National Research Council, the United States National Research Council. That's the National Academy of Sciences um, public publication branch. And they make it clear that what we've been doing isn't going to get people ready for where we're going. And so we need to change. Um, and furthermore, we need to make these changes for all students and not just the top 20%. Historically, at least for some people, there were good jobs, uh, or at least you, know, uh, you could live a, make a comfortable wage without having an extensive education. But even then, it was only some people, and um, those jobs are gone. And a bifurcated system also is going to make productivity and growth unsustainable. Here's a um, headline from the New York Times about two weeks ago saying that the good news is employment is going up, but the bad news is that productivity, is, productivity per person, per employee, is flat and has been. We're sort of capped out right now. Um, so that, that's one reason to be interested in changing education. Another is that the U.S. This is another um, headline from about two weeks ago. The U.S. suicide rate is at a 30-year high for pretty much every demographic in society. Things are stressful. Productivity is flat. How we've just the way we've always done things isn't the way to keep going. Uh, yes. What's the bifurcated system? Um, where we teach some people. Good question. Right now we have a system that works for a small percentage of the students and who excel and manage to get through it. I did. A lot of you probably did too. But the other 80 percent or so of students, it doesn't work for. So that's all I meant. Where we we're, where we're doing a good job of preparing a small percentage of our students. Um, and changing education is pretty much going to be key, not only in terms of preparing the top 20%, but preparing everyone. Now, those of you who are graduating, you're in the top 1% of academic preparation. And um, you're really ready, as ready as anybody is in this country. And unfortunately, most of the rest of the country isn't. Does that say 1% of the country has a college diploma, four-year diploma? Oh, no, it's much higher than that. But I'd say in terms of really prestigious People have attended really prestigious institutions and have really top, top flight in education. I'd say, I'd say the people coming out of Vanderbilt are in the top 1%. I would say it's really um, right up with 
um, Ivy League schools, Duke, schools like that. Um, that's my opinion. I'm I may be biased, but not by a lot. What do you think a college, what percent of the country has a four-year diploma? It's like 32 percent. I think it's 32 percent right now. But I mean, that includes all four-year degrees. And that, not all four-year degrees are created equal, I would say. There was an article last year in the Tennessean that showed for all the four-year institutions in um, Tennessee. And you don't realize how many institutions there are. And I think, is that number kind of going up? Are we having education inflation? Yes, more and more people. I mean, there are just a while, not even so, well, even I'd say when my father went to college, just going to college was a distinguishing factor. I mean, you were- 15% in 1980, Okay. Yeah, it keeps going. It's, it's going up and up. But so now, just having a four-year degree of any kind isn't enough. Just like certainly, just having high school is not enough. Um, we need to move beyond knowing what. Like so, right now, a lot of classes focus on what do scientists know? What do, what, do, what, 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 what is known about you know this era of history? What is known? It's sort of the what. And um, this report makes clear we we need to focus more on knowing how. And, um, and beyond that, in fact, beyond just knowing what other people do, or even knowing how other people do it, is self-identifying as someone who can do, as someone who engages in inquiry, someone who could be a scientist, someone who could um, do math, someone who could write, and asking why. So we really need to change from this idea of information being delivered to be memorized. Um, that was a real focus of education, I mean, even through my education in K-12, and probably through most, of, most all of yours. My final exam, um, the last course I took as an undergrad, and I was a biology major, was in anatomy and physiology, and the test was a, basically about the, the names of the little bones in the head, the, the fossae. I mean, that's um, probably important for some people, but not important for everybody. Now, we're making, there are some changes in this direction already, is the good news. The next generation science standards and the common core standards are beginnings with pushing on this idea of moving beyond what. Um, certainly they're contentious and it really involves a lot of tension between states' rights and federal rights. Lots of things are getting invoked. But the fact is that these standards uh, really are about moving beyond knowing um, what year some historical event happened and knowing why and thinking about why it matters. The why and the how. Um, or where we're going, but we need to go even further than that. Um, and interestingly, the changes are most needed in disciplines we tend to hold as most prestigious. Um, our society tends to hold uh, the natural sciences as the most prestigious disciplines. And I mean, and it's, but if you think about what's taught there and what education K-12 tends to focus on, and even in the undergraduate level, it tends to be pretty heavily focused on memorizing stuff, either straight up facts or um, formulas that you apply. Like, you know, it's like whether it's the formula for determining acceleration or it's the formulas for determining, um, you know, in math, the math is all about formulas, so stepping out to math. Math is a step better, it's less memorization of facts, but it's still largely about using, applying a formula or an algorithm over and over again without any context or toward any goal. You know, it's one through, how many of you, ha, you're, you're, you think of a math homework assignment as being one through 31 odd? You know, that's, that's what math is. And we are convinced that's what it is because that's how it always was. And we're heavily apprenticed to think this way. We spent, everybody in here spent, you know, 12 years K-12 and then did, a, did, did some undergrad likely. And so we have a pretty clear idea of what education is. And so when it's different, we get mad. It's interesting to watch um, when people try and change what math is. Pe um, people who've had math say, that's not what math is. So we're, we're, very, we're pretty dyed in the wool about what math is and what science is. But to step back and think about an English class you've taken, while in English classes historically, there's always been an emphasis on some memorization of vocabulary or grammar rules. Um, there's always also been a real understanding that there, it's about being able to read and make sense of ideas, and it's about being able to communicate ideas, and it's about being able to analyze ideas. That's really a step ahead of what we've thought of doing in math and science. And even interestingly to me, um, art classes, which are usually sort of, you know, people roll their eyes, 
at the very least, art classes have always focused on this idea of inviting people in and helping them understand that they might be someone who could do something like this, to engage in that, to do that thing. Um, so that's really, and if you come to, if, if you talk to um, faculty in the arts and sciences and the science classes, people are pretty convinced that they're teaching what ought to be taught. And for some, re for some times that's the case because of high stakes tests that are going to be measured. I mean, biology is heavily ruled by the MCAT because a lot of people are going to take the MCAT and if their students don't do well on the MCAT, that's a problem. And understandably, I mean, the students who want to take that. So it's not all flexible, but people, even faculty, tend to be fairly dyed in the wool and thinking inside the box about what education is. So where might we be looking, and actually at this point I wanted just to take a break, I put in some time into this talk for you guys to get to talk so it wasn't just me talking at you. I wanted to have, take, have five minutes for you guys to think about what has changed most in society over the last 40 years and what do people really need? Let's, let's just scrap what we think education is. If you're going to be preparing the population of the United States for the coming century as citizens, as workers, as human beings making decisions for themselves, what do they need? So I just take, take three or four minutes talking to each other and then we'll just share some ideas. So just to catch up for the people who just came in, because of the rain, obviously people are coming in. Uh, the, basically what we've been talking about is the idea of, while many areas of society have changed over the last 40 years, education hasn't particularly changed. Um, it's really focused on this idea of conveying um, material, a teacher conveying material to students who sit. Um, and now what we've been doing as a group is thinking about what people in our country will need over the coming century. If we can just say, let's forget about what's education now, let's think about what people need. And so why don't we start by just sharing some of those ideas that, is anybody willing to share anything? What are some things we need? Yeah. Absolutely. What, what else? What are some other things people decide we, people are going to need? They need jobs that artificial intelligence aren't going to take over. So skills that, skills that, other, that can't be taken away by machines, basically, or computers. Yeah? I think being willing to abandon the economic growth as a be-all, end-all, most noble goal paradigm. Mm -hmm. Things like climate change and like tangible environmental degradation. Absolutely. What what else what else might we need? I think you just have to constantly re up your skill set and be ready for all the changes. You are not going to land at a job and just sit there for 20, 30 years. So navigating constant change in your career. Absolutely. Yes. Excuse me? How to, ask How to ask a good question. I think all, all of these things. And so the question is, how are we going to educate people? How are we gonna, what, should, what, what might education look like that might prepare people to do these things? Um, and where might we look for new ideas for transforming education? Because we tend to think, we, since we've all been so heavily apprenticed into what education is, it's hard for us to, it's almost impossible to start with schools and say, how should we change schools? I think it's better to start with, where are other places where people learn? And what can we take from those ideas about how we might uh, restructure education? And today, I'm just going to talk about digital games as one, providing one interesting perspective. For, for thinking about things. But I'm certainly not saying that's the only place to look. I think there are a lot of very rich places to look, from how people engage in learning about hobbies, to how people learn first languages at home, to how people learn to cook at home, to um, productive apprenticeships and internships. You know, there are a lot of places where really powerful and useful learning happens. Um, but I think digital games are one interesting place just to think about as a comparison point. Uh, and Digital games generally have simulations at their core, whether it be this, a golf game, a Tiger Woods golf game, 
it's World of Warcraft or it's a marine science game. And um, as you play, becoming better at that game involves learning how to, how, to, how to operate on that simulation, that model. So in some ways, you're learning, games are about, lear not all games, I mean Farmville maybe not, but m many games um, are on, and certainly the ones up here are about learning to master and, and, con and control models and simulations. And they don't have to be about goblins and, and orcs. Um, here are, here's an educational game of the, from the previous slide about marine science. Here's one where p players take on the, um, the, the role of being a wolf in a wolf pack. Um, here's MIT has built a bunch of games um, and other people have called augmented reality games where as you investigate an area of a city, um, different, you are able to uncover various information based on where you go in the locations. Um, puzzles. And what's interesting about these well-designed digital games with, under, with underscoring well-designed is that they help players develop a deep understanding and mastery over the models in those games. Um, that's what, um, because, well even before I go further than that, these games are pr very complicated in many cases. In fact, they're far more complicated than anything we try and teach in school, at least in science classes. Um, in science classes, we, and we have all, we have everything we have, we can give grades to incentivize people, we can offer, you know, withholding people from moving on to the next year or punishments if they don't. We have all sorts of extrinsic kinds of controls. We have them, they have to be there. And we still don't really, aren't that ambitious about what we're trying to teach. We've decided we can teach force and motion in less than a week because we're not gonna go very deep into it and then we're gonna move on to the next thing. So we don't tend to, in schools, aim very deep and these models that people are, like in World of Warcraft, are far more deep. The, the kinds of things, or and it's not just even digital games, like a game of Pokemon, any of these, or Magic the Gathering, those collectible card games. The, uh, the complexity of the relationships between the elements in the games is far more complex than anything we try and teach. And on top of it, games can't make people sit there. Games, in fact, and if games can't, if you can't figure out how to play the game, it's not gonna sell, and that company's not gonna make any money. So game, game makers have had to figure something out about helping people learn things. And um, so, that, that, so that's why, it's, it's why I'm saying it's an interesting place to look. Here's this really complicated thing that people are not only putting a lot of time and effort into, on, you know, of their own time and volition, they're often paying money to do it. I mean, imagine if school were that way. <laughs> um, and games are engaging. Another reason what's interesting to think about it is, according to a, a, a fairly well-known survey three years ago by the Pew Center, 97% um, of teens play some kind of digital game, and actually f about 50% of adult males and females report playing video games. So it's not, people are doing it, and it's complicated, and often you have to pay for it. It'd be a whole lot easier just to watch TV, right? I mean, just sit there, you probably already got cable, um, not too hard. There's plenty of other hard things in life. So why are people choosing to do, learn this hard thing? Um, and, what it's, and while I'm from academia saying this, what's interesting here, is, this guy is the former chief creative officer of Sony Online Entertainment, one of the largest game companies in the world. And he, um, in charge of all of Sony's games for a long time, and here's, this is a book about his theory of what fun is that sort of guided his design of all these games. And, and it continues to be very, this is, that's the 10th anniversary edition. Recent, the big conference every year for games is called, or one of them is called GDC, Game Developers Conference, and he speaks at that. And recently he did his 10-year retrospective on this. And people line up. People want to hear what this guy has to say. And fun isn't just things blowing up or getting gold or getting a new building in Farmville. I mean, some of that can be fun for, for a little while, but that doesn't last. What fun is, what, he's, what he, he, he claims and has figured out and drives the games to make, is fun is figuring things out. Fun is learning. That's, I mean, that's, this is the guy, this is not me saying that. This is Sony Online Entertainment saying that. And so these things, are, they're, they're complicated. And they don't have to be about you know, goblins and killing things. Um, Diner Dash had over 500 million downloads as of a, a few years ago. 
and that's about um, serving tables. And here's the Sims, that sold 175 million copies as of, again, about a few years back. So one of the biggest selling games of all time. So there's something about this that people like. And to be clear, I'm not saying we should play lots of games in schools. That's not the message. Um, instead, we should be looking at digital games and other informal learning environments to rethink what learning might be in school. And we need to rethink what we should teach, what matters, and how to do it. And a key idea already, just even from the, those last few things, is that we need to move beyond, motivation to learn goes well beyond shallow ideas of fun, you know, like flashy colors and big pictures, um, and well beyond extrinsic rewards and, rewards and penalties, which is pretty much how school motivates people to learn right now. School right now is about, we're going to give you an A if you do well, and we're going to give you an F if you don't. Um, and that's pretty much why you do it. And you know, the, the classic question in school is, why am I learning this? And the classic answer is, because it's going to be on the test. Um, now this guy, now these aren't, it's not like we even had some other ideas about it. This guy is um, Paul Pintrich. He uh, did, he's a very famous educational psychologist. And he did an extensive review of the research in educational psychology on motivation to learn. What motivates people to learn when people want to learn? And he created these um, five, he distilled it down into five core ideas that are robustly supported by the research that he said, These are, this is what motivates people to learn that we know and uh, we ought to be doing in schools. And so, and of course, because it's research, it's got to have jargon. That's a t another topic. But so this is, what, this is the first one. And uh, adaptive self-efficacy and competence beliefs motivate students. And that basically means if you feel competent and you feel that you can succeed at a task, that's mo that, that you're going to be more motivated to learn. And that may seem like common sense, but it's not what we do in schools. And here's this guy saying it's we ought to be doing it more. And so he also created some, some, some design principles, which are these yellow things, for what ought to be happening in schools. And one is um, providing clear feedback um, to focus on the development of competence and self-efficacy. And then um, the other was, another was designing tasks that offer opportunities to be successful, but also challenge students. Now, in school, in terms of feedback, you do something, and how soon do you get feedback? Not right away. Maybe the next day. Entirely possibly the next week. Often never. Okay. Um, and we want tasks that offer opportunities to be successful but also challenge students. Since we have everybody do the same thing at the same time, for how many people is that challenge going to be optimized at any given moment? Is it possible to have it optimized for every, if we're doing one thing for everybody in this room? Is there any task I could, I could dream of that would be the right, perfect challenge for everybody here? It's not. And games have that figured out. I mean, you, you don't start here. You start on that one. Or you start on one that's even easier. And then rather than saying, you're going to do this one for two weeks, we say, do this one. And once you've got it figured out, then we're going to give you one that's a little bit harder. And we're going to add some more elements. And we're going to add some more elements. And so rather than this idea of everyone's going to do this for two weeks, it's everybody's going to do this and keep making progress. And when you're ready, we're going to let you move on once you've mastered it. That's another thing we're going to come back to. It's a, it's a very, rather than deciding everyone's going to do it for two weeks and then we're going to give everyone a grade on how well you can do it. Instead, we're going to, a mastery approach would say, everybody's going to do this and when you're ready, you can move on and keep, once you've mastered it. And so you, you'll keep moving up. And it, by doing that, everyone stays at a place or can be at a place where you're challenged. And not only that, if the first time you do this one or even the first time you do this one, you don't succeed, what happens in school if you take the test and you you, get, you don't do as well as you'd like. You move on to the next one. You know, that's, that's, that's done. It's not like, okay, you didn't do so well that time. Games are all about, um, it's, all, it's assumed you're not going to do it the first time, pretty much. And you're, but it's fine, built into the practice and the culture, that it's not shameful that you didn't get it the first time. It's that you go back and you try, and you, you, you keep working on that, and you come back, and once you've got it, um, you've succeeded, and that's great. You're ready to move on. Another one of the constructs, the second one, was this idea that um, 
if you think you have control over your success, in other words, you have an internal sense of control over your success, you're going to be more motivated to learn, as opposed to people who feel like the success is not determined by something inside them. It's, it's luck, it's what the teacher chose, it's whether the teacher likes them. Um, again, this seems like common sense, but it's not what we do in schools. Um, one of the things he was saying was to um, A, focus on self -control, some, some sense of self-control over the learning. Um, traditional media, as well as traditional teaching, tends to focus on a very passive role in learning, a re received role of learning, as opposed to a more active role of learning. Games are much more about active learning. And also sort of con giving people more control over how they're going to do a task. There are, there's control over superficial things like how you might look, which actually affects how people identify with the task and whether they, you know, giving some people some choice. But how you're going to do it is, is something we don't do. Everyone's going to do it at the same time, the same way. Uh, and then the third was when something is inherently interesting and you're motivated to engage in it for its own sake, um, you're going to be more motivated to learn. And so games are, this is Mass Effect 3, it's a game, a, a, high, a big selling game. Uh, there, there, you, you have choice over what you're going to do and there's a large variety of the kinds of things you can do. Um, different people are going to want to play games different ways. Schools aren't set up that way. Um, and there's a real emphasis on letting people build meaning around what they're doing, uh, which is another aspect. And then um, higher levels of value motivate. This is the um, third one. Providing tasks and material that are relevant and useful to students in some way and allowing them to identify with what's going on. Games are very good at that. Again, school tends to assume we just can, um, they, they, they want to get a good grade and they don't want to fail or have to repeat the grade. Um, and games, games don't have to be, as I said, about orcs and such. And the, the, a, a, a category of educational games called epistemic games, um, students take on the role, in this case, of, of, of techs at a, a dialysis company and they're, they're developing a new dialysis approach. And they, as part of the game, they're interacting um, with, well, game characters through, through this email and tools that are like those that would be used. Um, so they're engaging people in tasks. Let me just actually, and right here, this one, that's, this is actually, well, an educational game, but a famous one. This is called Fold It. This is, a, um, in it, it's a puzzle game where you're folding proteins, only you're actually folding proteins. You know, um, and depending on what's been folded, the, the top ones, then scientists actually try and build them. And there are a number of science uh, journal articles that have been written um, based on proteins that have been folded that way. It turns out people are better at folding, fold, at folding in, than computers can be. Computers aren't so good. And when you crowdsource it, um, some of these people, even if they don't really understand the science, are better at it than scientists. So there's, there's some built-in value. It's, it's called Fold It. I, mean, I think if you look it up, it's F-O-L-D dot I-T. Um, but. And then goals. The last is that goals motivate and direct students. This is the only one that isn't jargon. I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Goals motivate and direct students. Um, so Paul Pentrich was saying, well, we ought to, given that, and given that students have social as well as academic goals, let's figure out how we can harness both. And we try and do that. Games have got that well figured out. I mean, games have 40, 40 complete strangers working hard together towards a, on a task. Schools haven't figured that out yet. Because um, it's really, school tends to be a competition. And lastly, we're coming back to this mastery, mastery goals. Um, and he calls, like the grade system is what he called a norm reference standards or social comparison. When you use those, it's very demotivating for most students. Not for, not for the people who get the A's, but pretty much for everybody else. Um, and instead, use this idea of mastery. And once people have, uh, have and it's gonna mean, it would mean entirely changing how school is right now, but in moving it more into a system where people have, each, 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 each um, discipline is broken down into various units, and when you've mastered a unit, then you would move on. And we get rid of these ideas, potentially even of grades, Great, as, as in age groups and bands. Um, but so what are the lessons for schools? We've known this, but we don't do it in schools. So it's, it's worth looking at other places to see how that it can happen, and it does happen, because it, it makes it so clear that it's not happening in schools.
Now, those of you, you have succeeded in spite of the system, those of you who have graduated have, have, have succeeded famously. Um, but the system doesn't work for other people. And as I said, you're the top 1% of academic um, preparation, and you're going to be the leaders in the society. And so you are going to be the people who actually can um, have, have more voice, a disproportionate voice in how, what, how things change. And so I guess what I wanted to talk to you about on today was just rethinking as you go forward, you will have a lot of chances to weigh in on education. And the, the, the simple thing is this, like, how's it always been? That's how it's always been. Um, but that doesn't really work. And then later on at the end, on the final slide, you don't have to write down anything. Here are two books that you might consider reading. This one is all about what we can learn um, from games about learning and literacy. Uh, and then this is a more broader book. It's not about games, but it's rethinking education in the age of technology. And so it's what will you do? So now I want to stop and have you guys talk again and um, think about where have you seen sustained learning driven by interest? Like the kinds of things that we, we just talked, that Paul Pinterest talked about as being motivating. Um, where have you seen um, sustained interest driven learning? And do you have any ideas of how we incorporate similar ideas to change what education is? So we'll take, you know, three minutes just to talk, but just think about what is this? Have you ever seen, I mean, you can even start out with saying, have you ever seen interest um, driven learning? Things like the moonshot type investments where people drive themselves to compete and learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. And so everybody just talk for a second. Talk to the people next to you. Figure out where have you seen sustained interest-driven learning? And if you haven't, we're really in trouble. Thanks for coming. So where is anybody, just let's go around, where, where have people seen sustained interest-driven learning? Workplace. Yeah. The first one I think is sports. Um, people playing on teams, they, you know, they go to practice every day, it's a lot of fun, they watch their favorite stars, they play the same sports and video games, they learn how teams work together. Okay, that's a great example. Other examples? Yeah. And also music. Um, In music? And why, in and I'm going to come back to you, and why do people do this? I mean, in both cases, they're investing a whole lot of time and in case often money to, to do this learning. Why, why, why are they doing, why are they, why are they engaging in these teams? Why are they doing music? Achievement orientation. Get pleasure. So they might have an achievement orientation they feel good about achieving? Yep. It's just pleasure. You feel good when you do it. Yeah, it's fun. Feels good. It's fun. Anybody else? Have? Yes. Slightly offbeat, but following religious conversion. Re re religious? I'm sorry. Following religious conversion. Following religious conversion. Read everything they can find. And and why and why did and just tell me, and why and why, what is the motive? And I I agree. Just be, can you go further? Why why why, why what, what is their motivation? What is their motivation to read everything? And they want to know more about it, and they want to share it with somebody, and they mm -hmm. also want to be in a part of a group that has that core value. Mm -hmm. So they tend; to, it tends to be their the values-driven learning. Mm -hmm. Now, someone right here with us raised the point of there's folks that maybe are happy to do the same thing every day. You know, watch, go home, watch TV, mm -hmm. not learn. I mean, there are there, there's people that aren't motivated to achieve or to. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and we all like progress. I mean, it's interesting well, when you talk about things. That's that, I, that's an assumption. Well, it's possible, but I mean, I mean, if you think about like. Doing, sometimes even doing something like washing the dishes can be satisfying because you can see progress. And feeling progress and seeing progress is motivating. 
see it all the time on the tennis court or the golf course. Mm -hmm. yeah. People keep wanting, yeah. Uh, well, in, he was talking about people who aren't motivated. Mm -hmm. And there's, my boys, I've got some grandsons I'm raising, they go to an alternative school. Mm -hmm. And that school is basically, they give them all kinds of things they can pick from. You know, what are you mm -hmm. interested in? What can, you know, and they let them try all these different things. And then their classes in science and their classes in different things are scheduled by, maybe they take the kids out hiking and do, um, you know, mm -hmm. things about. Yeah, which, uh, which sounds like. And then they go out and they, maybe they're interested in um, the land and the, the nature, and they'll go out and teach them things in nature for part of their science. So, I mean, yeah, I just want to bring back, or actually I can do it this way. It's going back to the things we are, these things, I'm hearing from the things people are talking about from the, when we talked about the social, social goals and uh, combined with academic goals and people wanting to work together, I've heard that. Interest driven, choosing, having some choice and self-control. I mean, what, we're, what I'm hearing across a lot of the things that people are saying are the things that we saw that Paul Pinterest was talking about. So it is, a lot of these things are common sense and they're also re reported by research, but again, it's not, tends to be, even more academic things happen outside of school. You can think about often for, it happens for, it's, it's, we can probably think of more examples for younger kids, but dinosaurs. Some little kids love dinosaurs, and then they decide they want to read everything about dinosaurs, and they want to become an ex a specialist on that, and they get affirmation for the progress they're making in it, and they get to meet other people who are interested in that thing, and they will go deep and far with it. And people at, old, at, at older ages do it too. When you find something that you're passionate about, it becomes, it moves from just being something you learn about to becoming something that's a, is part of your, this, your social fabric around you too, because you find other people who share that interest. Um, Doug, I want to make a connection back to this group, because what okay. you said is really interesting. They talked about people who perhaps weren't motivated, yep. and I think your connection to dinosaurs is an important one to make, is that if you look at early childhood, very, very young children, they're learning machines. Sort of back to what the gentleman of the group up said, is children were created to learn. That's what humans do, they learn. If you look at very, very young children, they are motivated to learn. They want to conquer their environment. So what you're getting at is there is something about the environment around a child that could absolutely take away that motivation, that can make them so that they're perfectly happy to sit and watch TV. Yeah, they drop out. Exactly, they're so to discouraged. assume that it's a human feature, is, you know, I think we can push on that from an early childhood perspective. We're created to learn, we love to learn. Children absolutely yep. love to get invested in something and learn, but there's something that we're doing in the environment that's depressing that. So we actually see kids who have absolutely no interest in learning, perhaps. Yeah, and in terms of, and it can, it can be on, like when I, was, I can't remember if, if you guys were in when I showed this slide with, from um, the, the, the former chief creative officer of Sony Online Entertainment. And he says, fun, is, fun in a game and the kind of games they make is learning. So for a lot of people, it's seeing that progress. Yeah, yeah go ahead. I, I would say that it's hard to say that somebody is unmotivated because there, that doesn't really mean anything. When you think of someone that is not motivated, they still probably like to play games. It's or they may not do motivated some... to do the current things that are obviously very boring, that are school or something like or that. Or demotivating. Yeah. It's... If you're someone who gets the C's rather than the A's, yeah, exactly. We're... you pretty much quickly decide that's not the thing yeah, I like. The, I don't... I don't think I've ever met somebody who wasn't able to be motivated about something that they weren't interested in. That doesn't really exist because, mm -hmm. just like you said, people are really, they want to learn. That's a part of, and it's fun when you get, do it the and right way. And people want to feel a sense of agency yeah. and a sense of, sense of competence. Yes? Well, you, you get motivation, as you say, by, you know, mastery of a, of a subject and <coughs> positive feedback. Mm -hmm. and feeling like you're in control of those things you went through and probably the people who are demotivated are exactly that. They somehow couldn't find mastery of something. Or at least in the context they're where you're seeing them not motivated, they probably can't find it. Dyslexic or colorblind and they maybe even had a structural issue. Yeah. They couldn't gain mastery. They got negative feedback and they felt like they were not no longer in yeah. control. You no, know, it, bl it blew me away when I was a teacher. Um, kids who would rather 
not even make a guess or try, they would rather fail by not trying than to try and not do well because then it was because they weren't good enough. It was better for the, the story they could create in their head that I'm, I didn't do well because I didn't try it. Right. It's better. Yes? So it seems like a lot, a lot of learning is really driven by curiosity. Mm -hmm. And so what causes people to no longer want, why is it going to wait? Let me figure that out. What part of a brain? And um, I, I see, you know, there's, there's so much information flowing to the point where kids um, of my son's age, for example, had been raised with all this sort of instant information available to the point where they no longer are able to simply know where they are with a GPS in their hand. They're not able to kind of answer the simple questions for themselves. They're so used to having someone else or some device hand them the answer. Mm -hmm. So, And I'm not being very articulate, but there's some of these ideas of curiosity and learning are all tied together with, it's, it's become too, too easy to, to, to you know, get have your parents hand you the answer mm -hmm. in kind of a metaphoric sense. Yeah. You know? that, that's a very interesting point. Yes? Another way that I see people's passion for learning comes out in building something tangible. Like I, I mm -hmm. live in San Francisco. We're surrounded by technology. And it's a culture built around learning new things because then you can build things that are valuable. Mm -hmm. And when the things are valuable, you take a lot of pride in that process. Mm -hmm. I think all these things, so I think we can all think of things that where we've seen sustained interest driven learning and it seems like a lot of the ideas are, are hit on here and, there's, and there are others. And what's interesting is when we can think of all these things and we think about what, how we've structured school, it seems like there's some room for improvement or change. So let me just, I just want to get back up where I was. Now. The third part, that was part two of three. Third part, closing up, is shorter. And it's about to encourage you also to um, be willing to change your own life. Those of you who have graduated are going to be making a whole lot of big decisions in the coming years. And it's, um, as from those New York Times headlines, it's a, it's a, it's the, society is becoming fairly complex. I'm not, that, not to say it hasn't always been, but it certainly is now too. And so, in terms of your ability to flourish in the coming century. And what a lot of people aren't as aware of, there's a scientific field as of 1996 focusing on what they call positive psychology. And it's not pop psychology, it's, it's called positive psychology. It was founded by Professor Martin Seligman at the University of Pennsylvania as part of his election to the presidency of the American Psychological Association in 1996. And the whole idea was that um, psychology justifiably has focused most of its early attention on human suffering and alleviating human suffering. That's been the focus of psychology pretty much, uh, I mean there are exceptions, but that's been the primary focus over, over the last century. Positive psychology is a scientific study of the strengths that enable individuals and communities to thrive. Um, so there's that guy. It's, like I said, it is not the same as pop psychology. It's, these are people from, you know, the, top Ivy League, um, Harvard, Stanford, UVA, from real universities, real researchers. And what I would like to encourage people to do, uh, particularly those of you who graduate, just because you have so many, you're, I mean, you're gonna be around for, like, for a good long time, you're gonna be making a lot of decisions, is to read two books. And what I'm gonna start by saying is, these are people who are real scientists, this, this is Jonathan, Jonathan Haidt is a professor of psychology at University of Virginia. Um, Science is the journal of the uh, American Association or Academy for the Advancement of Sciences, which is the largest scientific organization in the world. And here's, here's a, I mean, here's one of his articles from I think 2007 in there. So he's a real, he's a real scientist. And this book um, by him, The Happiness Hypothesis, in it he's looking at uh, both ancient wisdom in the form from Christianity, Buddhism, ancient Greek philosophers, a lot of things that have been foundations of our society. And then looking at them in light of more, more recent research on um, people flourishing and, and um, being, you know, not just being happy in terms of the sense of like laugh, laughter, but leading fulfilled lives. And so, and Martin Seligman, the person that I mentioned on the page before, you can't see up here, but he's saying, if, um, begin, with, begin with height. 
basically is what he's saying. I can't read the whole thing there, but if you're interested in, in anything about doing well in the coming century, read Height. This is the guy who founded it all. So I, I'll put this up later, but you definitely ought to read this. Um, there's another s quote from Seligman. Um, the, the most brilliant and lucid analysis of virtue and well-being in the entire literature of positive psychology. Uh, here's another. Nature is one of the most um, distinguished science journals in, in, in the world. Here's what they typically publish, you know, across, and a re but yet a review in Nature of, of this book, you know, saying, saying basically it's a great book and retains scientific and rational coherence. So this is real. He just, when they try and sell in, on Amazon, they can't call it, you know, academic jargon doesn't work, basically. So I'd also really encourage you to read, um, this is really interesting. This guy, Daniel Gilbert, is from Harvard. And this book, this is what like the title, he also published in Science recently, Prospection Experiencing the Future. You know, that's not gonna sell much. So here it's, it's called, here's what we call it here. But it's all about the science of how the brain works and how it simulates future events. Because like when we're trying to think about what's going to happen at some point in the future and how we simulate in our brain and the, the, the systemic biases in terms of how that process works that throw us off. And so for people who are going to be making a whole lot of decisions in the next year or so as well as over the next decades, um, it would be very well th worth reading. It's short and it's absolute pleasure. Both of those books are on you know, Amazon, Audible, Kindle. You know, they're, they're not expensive, you know, they're whatever, 12 bucks. But so, highly recommend you read those because, um, and here, oh, here's Stephen Levitt, the author of Freakonomics. Think you know what it make, takes to make you happy. This absolutely fantastic book will shatter your most deeply held convictions about how the mind works. Um, Malcolm Gladwell of The New Yorker and writer of Blank and the Tipping Point. If you have even the slightest curiosity about the human condition, you ought to read it, trust me. I mean, these are, they're, this one in particular is very well written. I'd say the other one has more, to, more meat to it but both of them are good. So I would encourage you both, in addition to saying, hey, you need to change education for everybody else, I want to encourage you to think about your own ongoing education as you move forward. I, I, I love these two books. I think they're just terrific. Um, so in summary, I wanted to challenge you to th about how you think about education and how you think about yourself. Um, and we've always done it that way isn't a good answer, and it's definitely, in terms of education, what we'll hear. People hate it when you even think about changing what math is. You know, try and change math, you'll have every parent, every kid, everybody up in arms. Um, but it's not going to work. We need to change. Um, and as I said, you will be the leaders of industry, education, nonprofit sectors. Um, you're going to be the ones who can change it. So I just wanted to encourage you, in closing, to really think outside the box for yourself and for education and the nation to flourish. And that, that's it. And there are those books in case you want to take a picture or whatever. But we also have about five minutes or so to, if anybody needs to go because you're wet and you can't stand it anymore. Um, and also, thank you so much for coming in such horrible weather. Um, anyway. But so I also can take questions if people have questions. Yeah. Uh, it was mentioned a few times that Maybe environment affects a student's capacity or agency to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, because we have a one size fits all classroom model. Mm -hmm. Is there any really substantial research around alternatives where you have 20 or 30 students in a classroom on how you can engage them outside mm -hmm. of putting kids in rows and forcing them to pay attention? Um, there are a lot of different approaches. Some are reasonably, I mean, I think even the the, the, the kind of structure that um, this person was talking about where you can pr provide people more choice. There are multiple levels of differentiating instruction. I, one simple way of differentiating instruction is to give people choices of the assignment. Give people, say, do th do choose one of these assignments. You know, saying the, the, you can choose the kind of way you want to do it. It's, but you could also go even further. That's, it depends on how much you're willing to say we're going to change the structure. If, it's a, if, we're say, if we're assuming we're going to have you know, six class periods a day for 50 minutes and it's going to be on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on one of the discipline, disciplinary topics, even there, there's still plenty of room 
But I'd say as soon as we move out to having some more interest-driven learning and we change what we think it means um, for people to know. Right now, we're really bound up by assessment and what we can do um, in a cost-effective way. We as a society are pretty convinced we want to measure every kid individually. Um, and we only want to spend about 20 bucks. And so that limits what we can really do. You know, the, when, a, when, a, when a business was going to hire somebody, that's not how they assess somebody, you know, for, for a, 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 an important position. Um, Did you say earlier that standardized testing was a step in the right direction and it seems to go counter to the... No, no, I think standardized testing is, it depends on what we're testing. If we could figure out a cost-effective way to do, do high-stakes testing to test things we cared about, it might be, it might be a good thing. But if, but if what we can measure is people's rote recall, that's probably not what we want to incentivize. Because what, we've, what I've heard lots of people say is there's lots of information. We don't need people to be people who have memorized stuff. We need people who can act on stuff and think about stuff. So until we have ways to um, assess people's ability to do that, high stakes testing is probably pretty dangerous. Because people are also pretty good at trying to do whatever whatever the reinforcement schedule we've got them on is. Um, I think the way that it's been interesting to me to watch, when I was a teacher in classrooms, I'd, it was interesting to me, I th thought there was really no way um, schools could change what I was doing because no one even knew what I was doing. You know, you're in your classroom and, you know, and a, another adult comes in there about three times a year. Um, and then over the last 12 years, we've had No Child Left Behind. Um, which has brought in high stakes testing. What's been interesting to me is that we could make, force whole schools and teachers to do things they thought were really not in the students' best interests. You know, in terms of, I mean, when TCAP, here in Tennessee it's called, was called the TCAP, would come around, for the month before, student, it really became everybody in rows sitting forward trying to memorize things. You know, which just killed people's interest, caused lots of stress. as a parent and as a student to experiment while that's still the standard that's required to get into schools like this and everywhere else. Yeah, no, that's the, that's the problem with the MCATs when I talked about the MCATs, MCATs and the SAT. The LSATs, so you, can't, you, you, you can't afford to experiment because it takes so much time and effort to, to, to ace standardize. Yeah, and if you're not testing that thing, if we, what we care about is you thinking about you know, being a new a higher order thinking skills. Yeah, no, it is, I mean, that's why I'm saying the people, everybody who's in this room, in terms of how assessment is handled, how, um, and I mean, I mean, US News and World Report is a great place we could even just start if we could all somehow make, get them to change the weight they put on the SATs, because that really puts the weight on the, the universities, which puts the weight, you know, all of it keeps reinforcing. We've got to really try and step away from per, you know, basically perverse incentives. Right now, if only thing we can measure well, you know, or with reliability for individual students is, is basically recall or acting with, you know, sort of decontextualized formulas, we ought to be careful about making that more high stakes than it already is, I guess. I mean, it's, it's tricky. What, what we probably need to invest more in is, ultimately, we wish we could have assessment that, um, that measure the things we care about. Because then if you have that, then you have that as a more high stakes thing. That's good because it's driving change in the right direction. You just want to be careful about driving change in the wrong direction. <coughs> so is Vanderbilt as an institution doing anything to try and take the pressure off the SAT, ACT scores? What I'm interested to see is right now coming out of Harvard as of just a month ago was a report as about changing college admission standards and how it happens, not just in terms of the SAT, um, but also in terms of how applications are structured in terms of how many um, extracurriculars you can list, you know, and some things like that. You're trying to make it so that um, people have to, are encouraged to go deeper in a few things rather than try and do a thousand things a little bit, 
you know, there's, there's a, the lot, I think coming out of Harvard right now, there's a report which is hopefully going to bring about changes here and other places. Um, it's, it's, it's tense. It's the same thing with US News and World Report uses in their rankings. Somehow they managed to appoint, it was the most brilliant thing a comp that company ever did. Newsweek is gone and they're, they're flourishing basically because they decided they could be the ones to rank universities. And now what's, what's crazy is not only is it a good financial model for them, but now they are controlling because a, a major factor in their rankings it, are the average SAT scores of the people they admit. It means they can't afford to admit anyone who doesn't have really high SATs, but high SATs only measure one kind of knowing or ability or merit. Yeah, people are trying to, universities are now saying enough and submit making it Standard. optional and things like that. Yeah. They don't want to participate in Yeah. They're using SATs, though. I mean, they're using... Oh, Stanford is, but they don't want to participate in U.S. News. Oh. Yeah, there's all sorts of ways to try. They same standards to test people when they... They do, but they're not going to be driven by the... U.S. News and World Report. U.S. News and World Report has just done a marvelous job of positioning itself. It was just brilliant from a business perspective. Yes? Uh, isn't most learning and instruction very limited to, to one type of intelligence in terms of Gardner and other people? I mean, you're yeah. I mean, so it's, it's really, you know, to, to revitalize and reform the whole system, you have to change the types of intelligence that you're trying to... to and what kinds of skills. Right. And that NRC um, report I had up there really talks about the, what, the, what are the skills that are going to be important for the coming century, and they don't line up very well with what we traditionally are holding in our, well, either in our curriculum or in what we're testing. So yeah, I'll tell you one more, and then I'm going to let people go just because it's been a, you know, everyone's wet and it's. In, in California, we pretty much lost all funding for vocational skills in schools. Mm -hmm. So um, pretty much anything that isn't the core academics that can be measured easily is mm -hmm. cut. So the students who don't have necessarily an academic, who don't necessarily want academic rigor beyond mm -hmm. high school come out with very little context about what life could be outside of academia. Yep. So regarding race to the top and situations where we're trying to alleviate pressure from standardized testing, where, where do we go? Do we, have to be, do we have to just accept that we can't measure some things? I think that's a good question to ask. That, yeah, what, what are we, and I, I really do think we need to really think either Either we need to decide that we, how we're going to measure things that we do care about, or we're going to have to stop measuring. But measuring the things we don't care about is probably problematic. Anyway, well, thank you so much all for coming.